when the rest of us, were, when the happy people were down, then the other people who were down, they were up. They were like, no, no, you could do it, we could do this. And so there were just enough people so that we weren't all depressed about it at the same time, you know? And so I think that's probably why you see me breaking down at the end because I felt as though, for me, because I somehow had found myself as, in, as the face of this whole thing, I always had to be up. And so I was always the one like, no, no, we could do it, we could do it. Now I was crying in the bathroom at night by myself with some ice cream, but I couldn't let the group see that because I felt as though, oh, like they're counting on me to, to, to believe in this thing 100%. So I couldn't show any doubt. And so honestly for me, I'm still also kind of still not over it, even though it was a long time ago, but for sure I, I said, well, it was two years in, I need to give myself like at least two years to get out of it because it's such a hard mental space to be in, you know, for two years, but yeah. So how's that going because you're here now? <sighs> yeah, it's a little triggering, right? I mean, every time I come. I don't know that you're out. I'm just going to say that. Right, no, I know. No, I, I still, I feel all the feels. And when you watch it, it takes you right back, right, to those moments. And the first time Kevin had showed me the rough cut of the movie, sent it to me as a file, and I watched it on my laptop. And I watched it, I cried, I closed the laptop, and I couldn't watch it again. I was like, I can't, I can't do it. Um, but now I... I am enjoying reflecting back. Um, I have a little bit of perspective and I enjoy doing this now because I like talking to people about the experience and hopefully giving hope to other people who find themselves in similar situations and want to know if it's possible to win because it's possible. So let me ask you a question because while we're watching it, um, were you surprised by like the everyday racism that kind of reared? Were you, were you shocked? <laughs> Oh, I'm from Chicago, so no, I'm not, I'm not shocked. Um, I wasn't. Um, I wasn't shocked by it at all. Um, you know, from the South Side of Chicago, you know, I, I've been dealing with you know racism. You know, that quiet racism of the North, right? That polite, liberal, race, white racism. Sorry, we, we keeping it real here, right? No, one hundred percent. Okay. So you know, that quiet, you know, nice, you know. <laughs> I voted for Obama twice, I would have voted for him a third time if I could, kind of, you know, white racism. And um, I, so I was used to that. Um, and I was used to how politics works in, in the city of Chicago. I just had never found myself at the center of it, right? Um, and so that was what was new to me, was to see all of the all the, the dirty skeletons in the closet to find out that this all happened because one man went to Rahm Emanuel and said, we want that school. I mean, that was what was astonishing to me. How much power um, white privilege can give you. I knew that it could give you some, but I didn't know it could give you that much access. And that was what was shocking. Oh, and the other thing that was shocking to me is that you know, we know that racism is a system, it's a structure, right? Um, what was disappointing to me was to learn that um, uh, all skin folk ain't kin folk. And that there are, because, as you can see, the face who told Isaac, you know, you're wearing that Black Lives, that Black Students Matter shirt, that's an anti Chicago public school shirt, that's a black woman who said that to him. So they put, you can put black and brown faces in positions of power and have them perpetuate the racist structures. They told us many times, this is better for your children. Your classroom will be integrated. It's gonna be better for you. We had the alderman who was also one of the, um, the key masterminds, again, a black woman uh, refused to be um, interviewed. She came and visited our school because we're like, just come and see how amazing it is. She told somebody our school looked like an apartheid school. What? Yes, she did. Okay. Uh, sorry, you caught me up there. Like, yes, she did. There were so many black faces, it just looked like an apartheid school. So that kind of deeper level, I was, that, that did shock me. It did shock me. Okay, so let me ask this question. Like, so building up with the students, when y'all had the students, because I did some, I did a lot of youth organizing, mm -hmm. and I would always have a question in my head while doing the youth organizing. Our children are going to get their hearts broken. Like, yes. how did y'all weigh that? Like, the students' participation, because like that's one of the the weighty things we go through as 
you know, right. We want them to raise their voices, but we don't want to put them in danger. Oftentimes, they're put in danger. Right. So That's right. Yeah, and we had to be extra careful because we had middle schoolers. We weren't even dealing with high schoolers. So if you heard um, uh, the scene in. Um, City Hall, where they uh, busted through and they disrupted the, um, the 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 whatever situation was going on, the drunken police officer killing and somebody drunk driving, which is a whole other situation. Um, that was a high schooler because the, after they had announced that they were going to close NTA, almost immediately after that, they were going to close down all of the high schools in the Englewood neighborhood, which is on the um, south side of Chicago. And so we did have some high schoolers who were part of that. But um, we knew that our middle schoolers couldn't necessarily participate in the same way. Um, but our school has a social justice mission. So our babies sort of from the moment they're in kindergarten very much have taken control and ownership of what it means to be black in America and, and the, they're very proud of that. And so by the time they get to seventh and eighth grade, speaking out about it on these issues come very naturally to them. And in terms of their emotions and their hearts being broken, they knew that if they didn't speak up, their hearts were going to be broken anyway because they were taking the school away, right? And as um, they so eloquently said after we disrupted that CPS meeting, it's not for them, right? The altruism was what really blew me away. They're like, we're doing this not for us because we are leaving, we are doing this for the kids who are left behind. We have to go through this awful transition. So they they were all in. We didn't force anybody to do anything. They were the all we did was we made, we made up permission slips and had took them to give their parents to sign like we're going on a field trip to city hall to learn how government works. And then we would get everyone to sign a permission slip and take the eighth graders to city hall. And so that's sort of how we got around being so young, right? The the system and so we didn't get in trouble for that. Oh my goodness, thank you. And I'm gonna to try to wrap this up because I know the audience I'm sure has questions and things. So um, is there anything else you wanna say? Because I really, I have a million questions, <laughs> but I know they have questions and I want them to be able to ask and I feel like I'm gonna be able to snatch you at some point. Of course. And, some of course, of course. and ask those questions. So <laughs> again, I'm just, like, of course I'm in awe. Thank you for your work because it, it is taxing my body and spirit. Ooh, my and, and so we're just gonna open it up to questions from the audience, comments, just try to keep them to, you know, no lectures tonight. If you love your <laughs> just don't lecture us tonight. <laughs> okay, well, um, okay, I'll start with you and then go straight to you. Well, I, will, I commend you. Yes, sir. And I just think that more of us need to get angry because we're faced with the same situation down in New Orleans with our charges. Mm -hmm. 86% of them are failing. Why do you don't think there's enough angry people making up noise? Yes. If you don't make noise, and if you don't have the strength as numbers, mm -hmm. you're not going to pay attention. Mm -hmm. And that's just bottom line. Yes, you make an excellent point, actually. Um, two things. Number one, Initially, we did have a hard time uh, getting people engaged in the fight. In particular, the families, like the, some of the icky families and the families who lived in the housing developments like across the street, because of the history. Because I learned, because my daughter was only in second grade, so I was new to, to the situation. We, I learned, and we all learned, that, that this had been tried before. And that in some other ways, even ways that, that Kevin didn't capture, it had been successful. So originally, before NTA was built, all the kids did go to Southwood Elementary. And in the middle of the school year, one day, CPS, uh, when they built NTA, they recut the boundary, slipped a flyer underneath everybody's door, who uh, basically they, they, they X'd out all of the low-income black kids and put them into NTA, slipped a flyer under the door and said, Southwood Elementary is no longer your school, tomorrow you're going to NTA. And there wasn't anything that they could do about it. So we had a lot of parents telling us, or grandparents, really, oh yeah, they, you know, they do this all the time. They, they, this happened, and then this happened. You know, this is what they do. And so it took a lot of convincing. Like we know, but next this time we can fight. This time we can fight. So I understand the apathy, and it's hard to get people, especially people who have been, you know, had a boot on their neck for so long, right? The second thing is that, I mean, I don't know if y'all might know, but the person who helped destroy your school system is now running for mayor. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, <laughs> and, and nobody, 
Over yes, yes. So we're on a mission to make Chicagoans remember. Because Ballas was terrible, and our school system, too, came down here, messed messed up y'all's, and then messed up others around the country. And now, now coming back, talking about, oh, I'm great. Like, what? So we are trying to educate Chicagoans again, because, again, memories are short. Memories are short. We can't let people do this again. Yes, there are studies. And actually, that's what our lawyer, our legal team, had already collected. So we were ready to go into discovery. And so that would have been the next, you know, like the next step in the legal process is we would have gone into discovery. And we already had people, um, pump, we had doctors and sociologists on the record at public meetings. Uh, the sociologists brought out um, data that show that uh, when a school community closes, a child will lose at least, at least two years of um, education just from the closing of the school, right? And them having to move into an, a new school, a new community. And then we also had a doctor testify that said closing a school is like giving a child two packs of cigarettes to smoke a day. That that is how the negative impact on their health. And so we had all the studies, we had all of the information that our legal team had gathered in case we had to move forward with our um, with uh, the next step in the legal process. Wait, wait, say somebody a little. I would start putting that in a book and a resource for other communities. That's a great point. Yeah, you might actually bring resources to your community and doing that already put it together mm -hmm. to actually help anybody else in this legal situation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you had a question? <laughs> That's right, and that was part of our um, argument for why what makes NTA a special school is that we care about the whole child. So we are truly a community school. We have a clinic um, in the school building. We have um, a swimming pool. Our school, our kids get swim. We have a robust, um, you know, art and music and everything. So we do educate the whole child. And yes, you know, these stupid metrics like like testing and um, attendance right are deemed important by the district in terms of the rankings but our teachers and our administration never prioritize that over the education of the whole child and so i don't know what kind of extra magic they pull but they just do know that this is more more than just about you getting a good a high score on the test so that our school can get a high ranking it is that we have to educate the whole person. We have restorative justice instead of, you know, punitive measures of, of um, discipline, those kinds of things. Yeah. I'm really curious about like, at what point did you realize that you had a community and you had a movement on your hands? Like, uh, uh, I feel like we jumped right into the action with that, uh, that video, but I'm like, from being that voice yelling out, like, this is obscene, like, Yeah, so um, it started randomly at um, at a meeting for our ward with the aldermen. And we had been hearing, so so the history of the, 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 history of the school and the ickies was always known. 
and in the community, and I think, you know, in a black community, there's always whispers and there's always, like you always know things that aren't, that aren't spoken, right? And there had always been this whisper that this big, beautiful, brand new building is not for us. And, and that had always, it was built in 2002, but even when I, my daughter started there in like 16, it was still on the playground. I just would, he would hear it. And one day the principal and I, I had been elected to the local school council and the principal and I were randomly called into a meeting in, in her office, in the, in the alderman's office. And it was a weird meeting. It was like, what's your relationship with the school next door? Like, how are you guys doing as a school? And we walked away saying, what was that all about? You see your spidey senses start tingling, right? And then she had a meeting for the ward where she was talking about some other stuff, but a whole bunch of us said, you know what? We're just gonna go to this meeting and see if we can get some real answers. And so we went to the meeting, one of our parents stood up and she immediately was like, we're not talking about NTA, we're talking about these other schools. And we're like, but, 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 but we have a question for you. And Janice Jackson, the CEO happened to be there. She said, we hear rumors that you want to close down NTA. And Janice Jackson said, we, there is a plan, there's a plan. Now that's all she said. Originally the plan was to move the boundary and in, in essence they would move the boundary so that the students would have, we would have no students in the school. And that would be the first step, right, of closing the, well now you're under enrolled because we moved the boundary to right in front of your doorstep. And now you have no students so now we're gonna close you. And so we probably had about 10 parents or so at that meeting and that was when we were like, we gotta organize. And so we started a little group me, and then Nikita and I, um, who is the community organizer, who's like a fire, the, she does the uh, dog whistle speech. I love her, um, she's so great. So she and I said, let's start hosting meetings at the school. I would buy $5 pizzas from Little Caesars, and we would just start having people come in and say, look, this is what we think they're trying to do. Let's see if we can fight it. And so that, that's how it started. Why is it, That's a good question. They invited me back, and I did not want to go back. <laughs> but I talked to Nikita, and I was like, oh, I got another meeting invitation for another meeting in two weeks. She was like, you have to go. I was like, I hate going to these things. <laughs> so basically what happened was they said, we're putting together this transition committee, and they said to Isaac, send me like three people. Give us three names of three, because we're going to put three NTA parents on this, on this thing. And so he put my name and he put two other really involved parents in there. And of course, CPS on the CPS. They picked me, which they could not pick because I was the chair of the local school council at the time. And two parents, we had, were not on the list and we had never heard of before. And we, so of course they never went because we don't even know if they contacted them, right? And so I was ended up then only being the only NTA parent in, in the meeting. And we would have regular meetings and regular meetings and regular meetings. And I would just sit there and just be angry the entire time. I, I didn't bust it up any more times, but I, I wanted to. I did. <laughs> any other questions? Uh, Yeah, and you know, and I, my, my, my oldest child was in preschool, so I personally was not, I mean, I was aware of it because I saw my neighborhood school close, which was super disappointing to me because it was a highly um, ranked school, but I was sort of unaware because you're like in the middle of this crazy toddler baby stage, and I was like, what's going on in the world? I don't even know. Um, it was, it, it's chronic disinvestment, right? This, you know that this is, it's a plan. Right, it is a plan to empty our major cities of low-income black and brown people, right? And so, I mean, I don't, you're New Orleans, I don't have to tell you this, right? So you know how it works, right? So they, they shut down your grocery store, they cut your bus service, um, they, they, um, 
they tear down a building and now it's just an empty lot, right? They do these things, they raise your taxes, they take a, they take a building and they empty it out of people, then they rehab it and then they charge you know twice as much to either rent or to purchase it. And it's all done by design in order to move out the people that the city deems you know that, that they, they just don't want. And so it was part of this, they call it in Chicago Renaissance 2010. Um, and so it was part of Daly, uh, Mayor Daly's plan to revitalize the city. And so part of 2013, what they were doing was part of, was that, is that, is that all of that disinvestment had finally like come to a head. And they had successfully, and I put that in quotation marks of course, emptied out so many school buildings of all the resources and all of the children. Because in Chicago, the, the dollars follow the students. So if you have, and we have high schools that are built to hold 2,600 students that have 300 students in it. And so what can you do in terms of programming and education in a school where you have 300 students and only a certain dollar amount follows the student? And so they use that then as the reason why they could just take out the knife and just shut everything down. And so that's what made NTA so different is that we didn't hit any of those metrics. And, and all of the attempts to shut down the ickies and all of these things, none of that had worked in order to empty out our hallways of children. And so they had to come up with like this nuclear option. Um, so my question is, what is your advice to parents in other cities similar to yours that may, um, recognize that something needs to be done but they don't know where to start or what what is the thing that should be done what's your advice to parents who want to organize um i would say um if you find an issue that you want to organize around um find your people first of all there's always going to be that one nosy person who knows everything right <laughs> It, it, it's 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 that person on the block who sit who always sits on the front porch and knows what's going on, right? It's that person in church who knows everybody's business. It's the front desk lady at the school or at the hospital. You know, you always know that one person who knows everybody and knows everybody's business. And so, these relationships are built on trust, right? And true friendship. So become friends with that person. Don't make it transactional, right? This is not a, you know everything, I need you to do this for me. No, this is a friendship, right? You build a friendship, you build a trust, and then that person will introduce you to this person, introduce you to this person, introduce you. So I knew that I had built the trust, for example, when I got invited, when G2 invited me to like this secret meeting in the bottom of a church, like in the middle of the day, I had to like go and get like a little secret knock and they cracked open the door and I was like, I'm here for the meeting. <laughs> and then I went downstairs, like, oh, come in. I went downstairs, there were all these people down here and they were organizing for totally for something else, right? The teacher said, just come, we're organizing for some stuff that's going on on the north side. You sit here and you listen. So I just sat there and I just listened. And so that's how it starts, right? And then I would also suggest to you, um, FOIA requests, freedom of information requests, are your best friend. You have a right to know what your public officials are talking about and planning. And they will, they have to do it, they're supposed to do it, through their public emails, right? And through their public communications. And so you have a right to file a request with the city, with the Board of Ed, with the state, to get those documents. Get those emails, get those documents, find out what they're planning, find out what you're, they're talking about. Um, and if you, you will find on their websites how to do it. And if they tell you, you, they won't give you the information, you file it again. And then you file it again. And then you say, you have to give it to me. You will file it again. And each time you file it, you narrow your scope. Oh, you won't give it to me for a month? For a month's worth of communications? Give me two weeks. Oh, you won't do that? Give me one week. Give me one day. I just want one day of you talking about this thing. And you have all of your people in your posse file it, each person for a different week, for a different day, and then you get all the documents together and that will help you to game plan what's going on. And then you can slowly build a movement from there. You know, then you, you radiate out, you meet other people who are interested, you tell other people, you know they're coming for you too. You might want to join up with us. You know, and so that's how you sort of build your army that, that way. At least that's what we did.
I mean, I, I can't, they are special, right? I, can't, I really just have to say they are special. And I think, honestly, I, I, I have to say it's the, it's, the, it's the way that the teachers and the staff pour into those kids to make those kids believe that they are important in this world, that they have a voice, and that they have agency. Right, that, that they can affect change. Now they could be silly and you know they're loud and they act a fool sometimes, of course, because they're kids. But they know what's important and they know what their rights are. And so it, it, it just comes from adults. They we just have to tell them that we believe in them. And United let me say something real quick. Orleans. United Students in New Orleans, yeah. they stood outside of their school for almost three months protesting. The children from Walter L. Corner, Reed and Landry protested two hundred deep for months demanding their school. Our students did that. Mm -hmm. And then most of them, they were seniors, juniors, and sophomores, but the, the front people who put themselves on the line continuously were all seniors fighting for the kids behind them. It wasn't publicized a lot, but we do have those children in our city, and they did fight for our schools, mm -hmm. night and day, day and night. Yeah. And who was with them? To, to shut us down. However, folks just cannot give up on this high school. They cannot give up on this high school. And so there's a new proposal on the table to build a 1,200 seat baby high school. 1,200 seat high school that's gonna cost 150 million, I can't remember what the, how, what the number is now on the site of the Ickies, where the Ickies used to be. So literally, right, so you would, when the, when the um, drone pans up and you see all of that empty land behind NTA, well, they've already, since the movie was filmed, they've already built housing there, which is supposed to be, was supposed to be um, low-income mixed-use housing, which I don't think it is. And now, the rest of the land was supposed to be um, public housing, the Ickes, the Ickes families were supposed to be able to return, right? They're supposed to have a right of return. And now they want to put a high school on that land, okay? They have promised it to seven or eight elementary schools. So you do the math, because the math ain't mathing. To put, as an open enrollment neighborhood high school, 1,200 students, right? Was that 300 a grade? Um, and, uh, the main drivers behind this, there's two main drivers. There's a, the same people from the movie, but there's another driver who you didn't get a chance to see here because the movie would have been like three hours long, is our school is right next to Chinatown. And the Chinese and the Chinese American um, families who live in Chinatown have been, according to them, petitioning Chicago Public Schools to build them their own high school for 50 years. And CPS says, no way. We're not gonna spend money to build a high school just for you all. So you have to go to your public high school. Well, nobody likes their, their public high school option because they say their, the options are too black and too poor. Now they don't say that, but they say it's not an option, okay? That's, that's the dog whistle. So that community and the Southland community have come together 
they, to build this, to rally behind this brand new high school. They were together to close NTA, since that didn't work, they are coming together to try to, to, to build this brand new high school. But the wrinkle of it is that the Chinatown residents do not want to cross the bridge. Like they literally do not want to cross the bridge from Chinatown into where NTA is, because it's too many black kids. Now, of course they won't say that, but they don't want to do that. They want to have the high school built to the west where their neighborhood is, but the white parents want it built where they're being, it's being proposed right now. So Mary Lori Lightfoot promised the high school to be built in back of NTA. Um, she is not going to be our mayor anymore. And so now everything is, is up in the air. It's up in the air because we don't know. We know J Brandon Johnson is not on board. Who knows what, Val even if Val says he's not on board, I wouldn't believe him anyway. That's right. um, yeah. So, That's right. but we all know it's too much money. It's a waste of money. And our high schools are so severely underfunded and under enrolled that this is just a ploy to, because Chinese students Chinese families and white families don't want to send their their kids to school with black kids. Mm -hmm. Like period. That's, right. That's it. So they want their, their ba a backup high school for their kids to go to in case they don't test into a selective enrollment high school, which is a whole other thing and it's disgusting. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Sorry, that was a rant. <laughs> no, that was, look, we have seventy five percent of our white students are in five schools. Wow. 86% of our school population is black. Talk about Oh, that's school. not our sense. Like, that's I was too. Okay, so, and they're all selective and rural. Yes. No, okay. excuse me. They're diverse by design. <laughs> Um, it's a, you've heard that you've heard the data. It's like a, what if you get thirty percent or more black students, then white students start to run away. You heard that? Yeah. Yeah. So they, I'm sure they keep it low. Diverse by design. <laughs> Are you the first question? Are you asking about white allyship? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Allyship? I'm just reading what the question. Okay. Yeah. So I mean, Isaac is like he 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 could write a book on white allyship. Um, basically, he he is the kind of person who would, if he were here, he would tell you number one, you listen to the community, and you don't speak. <laughs> And um, you, he uses his privilege when necessary, but he, it, he's more a person who will kick the door open so that black and brown voices can go in and be heard first. And, and that is how he operates now. He's no longer, I should say this too, he's no longer the principal, he did not get fired, um, but he decided in 21 to, um, to step away and he said he would only step away from principalship if it went to someone he trusted and so Tanika Brooks who's the assistant principal is now the principal of NTA so he now does um, educational consulting so I think in his consulting this is what he's saying like how to be a good white ally is to do these kinds of things is to make ways make pathways for um, black and brown educators to um, to rise into positions of power right and then your second question was? How do you mobilize or engage parents who may otherwise not be so engaged in their kids' school life? Yeah, that's hard, right? That's a hard one because you don't necessarily know why parents are not engaged. So we found, we, we found, so for parents who want to be engaged, but who do not have the time, who work third shift, who, you know, the system is by design made to disenfranchise uh, working class families. So they would have, they have meetings at 10 o'clock in the morning on a Tuesday, right? They have, um, they have these community meetings. They start at five, but what happens when you get off at six, right? And you want to speak up in front of the board, right? What are you supposed to do? So for some things, or you have, you have a lot of kids and you need childcare. So there were a few things as organizers we were able to do. When we would have um, meetings, we would pay for childcare. Those of us who could would put into a pot and we would 
have, we would pay some babysitters to take all the kids in another room and just play and have cookies and coloring books and stuff. So that people could say, bring your kids, bring them all, right? We got that. Um, the other thing we did was we, we played a game with CPS if they hate it, but like stop us, you can't stop us. We, if the meeting, if the meeting started at five and you had to sign up to get a card in order to speak for your two minutes, those of us who could get there, we signed in and we got our cards. And then when parents started coming in at six and seven and eight, when all the cards were gone, we just handed the cards to them. They're like, you can't, you can't do that. Like, where does it say we can't do that? And so we did that as a way to help get those parents get their voices elevated. So because this is because the system has told them what you say doesn't matter, right? We, we don't want to hear from you. And so once you convince people that what they say that does matter, you sort of clear the way a little bit to make it easier for them. I will talk all day. Too. I can listen to you talk all day. Like I don't even need to be here. Let's be real. You're good. <laughs> Let's do like, like five, five minutes. Let's do we like have five minutes, so this will be the last question. So make it a good one. Mm -hmm. We want to end on a, you know. So get y'all juice. Like yeah, I might want to shake a little bit. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> get the good question. I'm boiling. So come on, come on, somebody. You have a good question. Okay. Well, I know she's gonna have a good question. All right. Who are you, ma'am? Who are you? I'm a person with a question. <laughs> Do you have any ideas um, for parents in, in these different cities on how they can connect these struggles? Because it's the exact same story in different cities across America. So do you have any suggestions on how we connect across the city? You know, and that's a, that, that's a great, that is a great question. Um, because the system is banking on us being siloed, Absolutely. right? And so if we don't know what's going on down here and we and you don't know what's going on in Oakland yeah. and Oakland doesn't know what's going on in Philadelphia, then we are all reinventing the wheel and we're starting from scratch and we're making it all much harder on ourselves. And you're right, I mean, we have a website, sounds like you all have a website. It's like we need to figure out a way to connect all of these. I know for our, for the movie, um, we put together a an educational guide. So at least PBS is trying to help push this out nationally in terms of how to uh, giving sort of a playbook on how to fight against the system. Um, I don't know. My personal contact information is in there, but if you Google me, you can find me. And so, if people have questions, they can they can email me. But certainly, I've had people just email me out of the blue, reach out and say, "This is what's happening." I just had someone email me at Champaign, Illinois, right downstate mm -hmm. Illinois, and they're saying, "We're doing this. We're having the same struggle. Um, can you help?" So, I, I think the more we try to make this national, the better chance we have of coming together and stopping this. Mm -hmm. when, I, when I see five minutes, I say that better be the best question ever, because I'm just joking, girl. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just joking. And since she, since she didn't have a question, it's your question. Sorry. It's okay. It's okay. I'm blind. <laughs> I'm blind. Uh, like, uh, saying, like, how do we get that out there? And, like, uh, you mentioned earlier that, like, somebody reached out and said, like, hey, this is how I can help you organize, like, by the guidance of organizing. It sounds like there has to be a, an organization or some organizations, plural, out there that help uh, people with their causes and organizing to connect those uh, movements. Like, uh, just like when, like, I was trying to be an activist, like, trying to help, like, I would feel like being, being too much, like, uh, off the skin off my own back and realizing there has to be a better way, there has to be some, I'm not the only one out there that is doing this. Like, have you come into contact with important organizations? Or I know a lot of them try to be a little bit more uh, underground because, you know, it's tight of like being busted, like union busters and all those tactics. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we worked with Journey for Justice, and so G2 Brown and Journey for Justice, um, he was the one who, he hooked me up. So really, he's, he's, the, he's the king maker. I mean, if you want to know about organizing, he's organizing right now with Brandon Johnson's campaign. Um, and so he really put me in contact, and he's got national connections. So if you look up Journey for Justice, 
Um, and they, they organize across the social justice space, not just education. And so they can, he can, uh, he and some, or someone in the organization can connect you nationally to folks. Okay, well, oh my God, this has been incredible. Y'all have been incredible, of course you're incredible. All of y'all beautiful and brilliant that I talked to and that I can't see, I have bad bitch, I'm just joking. All of y'all wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you, I mean, thank, thank you, you for you. this. Thank you so much. This thank was you. fun, thank you everyone. Thank you.